Hello. Hello, Beth. I'm a Vinny, your moderator for the room. Glad you. I sent you an email. I just wanted to make sure you had the link. I did. You know what? I would like. I'm in back to back meetings. It's crazy today. Like my schedule just went and blew up. So I am. I apologize. I would normally come 15 minutes early. So I apologize for that. Oh, that's fine. Um, we've already got people in the room here, so we can wait a minute or two to get started. Um, Great. Do you, can I share my screen, or uh, do you want, do you have my Prezi? A uh, link that you can. Uh, uh, no, I don't. So you, yeah, you'll want to share your screen. Okay, let me get that all set up. Um, okay. Do you see Prezi? Yep, I see the present. Perfect. Perfect. So, and for questions, how would you prefer people use the chat? They can raise their hands and we can call on them or? Um, they can use end. chat. If you'll let me know if there's a question in there, that would be, that would be so helpful. Um, now, okay. are we both able to admit or am I admitting as we go? Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do all that. Phew, thank God. <laughs> I guess I'm like, oh, there's a lot of them. I mean, that's exciting. I'm so excited. I'm excited to talk about things I love. So, happy day. Oh, yeah, that's definitely exciting. Where are you located? I'm in Colorado. Oh, I love Colorado. Got a bit of snow today. We got we had a little dusting this morning. It was quite shocking that we had so much dusting. I'm in Pennsylvania, so um, it hasn't. They haven't told anybody it's spring yet. So <laughs> <laughs> might be a little more than a little bit of snow. <laughs> I want to come to Wyoming and go hiking, Danielle. It's one of the 50 states I haven't been to yet. So I want to go to Wyoming. All right. well, I think it's 1030. We can go ahead and get started. This meeting is scheduled to go till 1150. And we do have a kind of a hard stop at 1150 due to other meetings and the keynote that's going on. Um, Perfect. Um, so for all the all the participants, we're going to go ahead and use the chat and we'll try to keep up as best we can as questions. Um, some of those we may have to wait till the end to get to, um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Beth and you can go ahead and get started. And this meeting is being recorded. Great. Well, welcome everybody. If you, if you are new to Zoom, which I feel like none of us are because we've all been in Zoom for the past three weeks. Um, if you click on your more button on, on your toolbar, you'll see the chat there. If you would let me know where you're from and if you've ever done an escape room, either physically or online. Never. Kelly has never done one. Oh, good. We have some experts in here. Philadelphia, woohoo! I'm in Palmerton, Pennsylvania, so thumbs up to Philly. Oh, from Vegas, I like Vegas. All right, perfect. So my name is Beth Ritter Guth, and I'm the Associate Dean of Online Learning and Educational Technology at Northampton Community College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I was tenured in English before I became an administrator, and I've always used technology to teach English and I've um, started with Unreal Tournament, for any of you who might be old enough to remember that, and uh, used things like Second Life, Grand Theft Auto, Fallout, and um, my newest passion is uh, using uh, Google to create VR tours for virtual reality for headsets and using escape rooms. I mostly teach online uh, because uh, I teach outside of my, my dean capacity. So I teach um, at Northampton Community College where I work full time. I teach at Union County College, which is a community college in New Jersey where I came from. And I teach at a four year university, uh, DeSales University in Pennsylvania. And I've been there for 25 plus years uh, teaching uh, face to face and online. So I'm excited to talk to you today about creating online escape rooms for students. Um, 
and uh, many of these principles apply to physical escape rooms if you want to do them uh, but this has been a, a very fun and engaging tool to use with students uh, to either introduce a topic or to summarize material at the end of a topic in a module i don't typically use escape rooms to teach content you know itself uh, but more as a um, an introduction or a summary at the end so if you have questions at any time just type them in the chat my faithful assistant will make sure that i see the questions and any of the tools that you see here you are welcome to use you're welcome to steal anything that you see here it's all open source um, but I feel like the best way to learn about escape rooms is to do one. So I think we're going to start there. All right, so you're going to go to this link here, this uh, Spitly, and then the lock station that you need to type in the locks, uh, to type in the codes is above. So if you want to, I'm going to try to, um, I don't think I, it'll let me copy and paste from from here. So you want to go to the escape room and you want to open your lock station and you have about 10 minutes. You'll have you'll have something to do at the end in the chat that will let me know that you have finished. So good luck. For those of you just coming in, we're uh, starting our experience with a mini escape room. The escape room is listed here and the lock station that you have to open to type in the locks, uh, the combinations are on this slide. Um, so, oh, thank you very much, Stacy. I appreciate that. It's not letting me copy and paste. I think they turned it off because of the bombing or something. Like there's some sort of copy paste rule. It, it is a horrible world of bored teenagers out there. So, um, so we're going to work on this for the next few minutes. So if you're just arriving, go ahead and jump right in. Which link isn't working? The lock station or the escape room? Beth, maybe you can both try to copy and paste them both into the chat. All right, I'm gonna unshare my screen. Yeah. For, so they, that um, don't work as links in the chat either. That was another one of the rules, just letting you know. Yeah, you'll yeah. have to copy and paste yeah. it. Yeah, and both of them want to share yeah, yeah, Zoom has disabled the ability for links to work directly from chat because of some of the security issues they've been having. So you'll have to copy and paste them. All right, I'm gonna unshare just for a second, just so that I can grab them. Unless it'll let me on here. No, hold on. Ah. Oh, Stacey, did you type both of them in? Yeah, I did. Oh, I'm thank you so much. Okay. I'll put it again in case people have scrolled. Thank you so much for typing them in. Did everybody see them?
this is what you should see if you are able to op able to open up the is this what everybody who could get in can see for the escape room form yep and then the picture with the three things to click for the room. yep And this is what you should see if you're in the room. Okay, let's see. For Shell, um, Shell, what does your lock form look like? And Susan, here's the link for the lock form. Okay, so this is the escape room in itself. You don't you don't put the answers in on here. You have to put them onto the lock form. I just put the link in the um in the chat How are the puzzles going? Is everybody figuring them out? I can't tell you the, the answer, Cecilia. It's an escape room. You have to escape. Look at the word used in the sentence. That will be the clue. I'm a mathematician, so I love coding, so this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody solved the locks yet? <laughs> well, fortunately, Laura, we don't have four hours. Did anybody get number one yet? Oh, 
right at 12 uh, it's i'm two hours ahead of you so at 12 45 it will reveal some information well we'll do something at 12 45 how's that so a lot of people got two and three but how many people are stuck on number one <laughs> so it's like, let me out. I think I have to go look at that abstract list to get number one. I already forgot. Lots of people. Has anybody solved number one yet? Anybody? I think I have. I just have to type it in. <laughs> Trisha, Trisha's willing to trade bourbon for the answer to number one. All right, it is 1245. Everybody please type the one word that you're feeling right now in the chat. And you won't offend me, I promise. Entertained, energetic, curious, confused, frustrated, lost, high. Well, you're in Colorado. Frustrated and energized, slow. All right, that's good. That's exactly what I wanted you to feel. I intentionally designed this room to be frustrating because this is exactly how our students feel when we don't give good instructions, when our things aren't tested, and when it's not clear what you're supposed to do. So it's a trick. If you've seen me do this presentation live, I, I do it and I do it there as well. So the best way to teach, I think, how to make these is by showing you an example of what can go wrong. Because your students, when they're online, aren't in a Zoom room with you doing this. Well, they could be now during COVID, but typically I do this and they do it on their own. So imagine how frustrating it would be if you were alone at home trying to do this without somebody helping you without talking to friends while you're doing it right so let's look at number one number one is start here the presenter is zipped here from bethlehem pa what did you think the answer was i got it wrong but i thought it was northampton okay it should be the zip code of northampton did anybody think the zip code of bethlehem pennsylvania what is the zip code of Northampton Community College, which you can get from northampton.edu? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, zero, two, zero. Okay, type that in and see if it works. So if you've not done an escape room before in physical space, there's always an onboarding that happens like the people that run it that charge you the 20 bucks an hour or in, in Philly it's like 50 bucks an hour they give you like a little onboarding experience that kind of goes over the theme this is Appalachian Trail themed I'm a long distance hiker so I live on the trail I hike a lot I've hiked a lot in Colorado um, so there would be sort of an onboarding and you would have your students you know prepare to be a hiker and pack their backpack and talk about hiking and this is going to be you know something to reinforce something that we learned about the trail or whatever and so you would tell them that not everything is a question there are some statements and clues that you have to figure out and clues aren't always questions right so um, so that is one one thing is to set up the environment for your students and let them know what to expect and how to solve the problems, right? Um, sometimes we have typos ourselves, right? So in the form, if, the, if there's a typo on the answer key and they're trying to type in 18020 and I've accidentally typed my home zip code, which is 18071, they're never gonna get it, right? So definitely, definitely test your, test, your answer sheet and definitely give them some onboarding advice, right? So that's key number one. Number two is 
students may not know what a Caesar cipher is and they may have no idea how to go and figure it out, right? Now you can Google online a Caesar cipher, uh, type in these words and it'll pop out. You don't necessarily have to do it by hand. You can use the internet to, to help you. Um, so whatever puzzles you choose, you know, make sure that students have a way to solve them. Because if they don't necessarily, if I'm teaching ethical hacking, I might want them to memorize a Caesar cipher. But other than that, my English students, you know, they don't, mess, they don't even know what it is. So definitely when you're using puzzles, make sure that they're puzzles that students can solve. So uh, Caesar cipher is a, I'm going to give you a site at the end that has all kinds of puzzles on it for you to use for your, um, but make sure it's a puzzle they can actually solve. And then the third one um, was the thing that you had to shout out, which was, everybody type it, take a second. Let me out. That's, <laughs> no, I feel like that at the end of every Zoom meeting that I've had to go to for work. So now that you know that I was sort of tricking you, what do you think? Was it a good experience? No, Sophia says no. Okay, so let's talk about how we make these. I'm gonna unshare my screen just for a minute, um, just so that I can see my screen because everything pops up here. Let me get out of here. Okay. And then I will share again. Uh, All right. And then, All right, does everybody see my screen? Okay, perfect. All right. So this is what we did first, and now we're going to talk about how they're built. So the toolkits that I use, and I apologize, I will, um, when we send this out, oh, come here, I don't know. When I send this out, I will, um, or, or if somebody would uh, be so kind as to type these into chat so that people can click on them. The main tool that I use to build online escape rooms is ThingLink because you can take an image and you can put the little dots on it. It's a free tool. You can um, type as many things as you want on it. How many of you have used, has anybody used ThingLink in here before? Okay, it's a great tool, great free tool. I use some other tools along with it. Sometimes I'll use Edpuzzle. If I have a video that I want them to watch, I'll use Edpuzzle, which is all, um, I'll type in the, the URL. So um, thing link is that and Edpuzzle is this. Um, yes, yeah, so I can send out the list of tools to go with the presentation. So Breakout EDU is actually a proprietary kit. You can purchase them, they're like $110. It actually gives you physical locks and a physical box that students have to break into to get out, clasps and stuff like that. You don't necessarily have to buy the box though because the resources you can get for free on the site. Um, you get more resources if you have at least one box. So um, I've actually priced it out to buy because I, I end up replacing a lot of physical locks for the physical boxes that we have. And it is cheaper to actually buy the kit through Breakout than to go to Home Depot or even Walmart to buy the locks, the physical locks, if you do this in physical space. It is cheaper to buy it through um, Breakout EDU. The only hint I would give you is that their locks are kind of junky and they break and they are hard to reset. They're hard to set in the first place. So Home Depot has better locks, but it is more expensive to get everything that you need from like a hardware store. So, um, you know, so that there's pros and cons for both, but you do get their complete resource packet. The puzzle resources are free. And um, I'm gonna go to the, the resources so that you can, you can see what they look like. Escape here if it lets me. And here. So, can you see my screen? Do you all see um, my screen? I hope. So, these are all the different um, puzzles that you can pick. So, the one I used for the last the last clue was this uh, Stranger Things lights generator. 
um, but there's all different kinds of tools and you can use these for you know anything uh, this is a cipher wheel you know you can make sesame street things you can make fake checks so you can have all kinds of different clues and, and stuff um, here so this is a great resource um, is this online or can you print it out? What do you mean? Is this page online? I'm sorry, Mary. I'm not sure. You can print some of these out too. Is that what you mean? Like when you make them, you can print them out. So you can print out the ciphers. You can print out, um, some of them are just for online, like Powtoon's uh, Video Maker. Um, but you can make things that you print. The one thing about uh, breakout EDU kits is that they actually come, the thing that you get extra for the money that you pay is that they have over like 500 pre-made escape rooms that you can adopt from any age range, from kindergarten all the way up through graduate school to um, team building for employers. And then they have a whole community of people like me who make games and then donate the games um, to the other instructors. So for your $110, maybe it might have gone up since I bought some, since I bought our boxes, but you actually do get quite a bit. So, um, you know, so I definitely, I recommend at least buying one box and then you can make your own boxes after that. Because not every game requires every lock for the physical, but you do get some great resources and they have online games and they have um, uh, physical games also. So, uh, so Mary, when you get the puzzle, you can print it depending on the puzzle that you use, right? And you can also do a screenshot and, you know, print that out if you want, if it doesn't have a, if it doesn't have a physical way to print it out. So far, so good. Does anybody think they're going to use this page ever again? I, I love playing with this stuff. It's even great to make like fun cards for people like just fun little, you know, things for your staff, if you have a staff. And, oh, this is driving me crazy, hold on. And then the final link here is just, a, it's a YouTube link just so that you can learn how to make the form for the digital lock. So students will turn in that Google Sheet to me. That's how I know that they did the room and how they got out. Um, they actually have to turn the sheet in. Um, one of the things that you really can't prevent is cheating, right? So, you know, I assign the, the individually to students to do in the class, but if they talk to each other and they share the locks, you know, the lock codes out, you know, with people in their own class or people in the next class, you know, there's really no way to prevent it, which is one of the reasons why I don't use this kind of tool for like the grand assessment for a module. So um, for Dante's Inferno, for example, I, use, I have an escape room to introduce them to Dante's Inferno and I have an escape room to summarize the material at the end, but neither of those are like worth a ton of points in their final grade. So when I grade these, I give um, 25 points for just doing it and then 75 points for if it's a physical room, It'll be the 75 points will be for um, their communication and working with each other. And then if it's online, um, I, the escape rooms are meant to be a half hour long. This was just an example to give you an idea of what one would look like. Um, so the responses are different. They might be paragraph form because um, you don't actually have to have a number. You can be creative and have, you know, you have to get the right answer to get the next clue or, or whatever. I've done, I've done a bunch of different kinds of things for um for the escape rooms for literature so they get 75 points for their work and then 25 points for just doing it any questions so far yes you could have a url to take them to the next task you can make a video of your own you can do a screencast o matic i mean if you were doing a math concept or something and you wanted to use this for a math class um, you know, they could have to show you their work before they get the next clue. You know, you have the ability to really be as creative as you want, depending on how much time you want to spend on the task, how much time they, you want them to spend on the task. And so the, 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 the truth is, like any tool that you use, you want to make sure that you plan out what it is you want to do. So course learning outcomes should always be number one thing that we look at, right? What is it that I want my students to 
learn here and how does that tie to this course? Because nothing is more frustrating, I think even for us, than to do busy work or things that don't really tie you know, to a learning outcome. So you know, if, the, if a learning outcome is compare contrast, right? And I want to compare um, you know, the video game version of Dante's Inferno to the poem Dante's Inferno, then um, I want to build my escape room to do that, to have comparisons between the two, right? If I just want them to do the busy work of getting out of an escape room that's themed about Dante, um, it doesn't really have a goal or an objective. You definitely want to plan out what it is you want them to know, right? And so if you're just introducing a topic, it could just be to get them excited. Nobody gets excited about Chaucer or Shakespeare or Dante except for me. So it's really, when I use this for an intro, it's really to get them excited. And, you know, to find out like in Dante's Inferno, there's a whole level devoted to lust. You know, students love that. And then violence, they love that. You know, there's a three-headed thing in there. So I used, you know, like it's just to get them excited, you know, because then I can get them a little more invested in the literature. If it's at the end, right? If it's at the end, it might be to sum up, like which level was lust? Which level, where would you find um, the woods of suicide? Like where would you, how many heads does Satan have, you know, in, in the final circle? So, depending on which way, you know, which way you're using it will determine what you want them to know. So that's, that's tip number one. Tip number two is absolutely test these because like, like you were frustrated. Now I purposely did not give you an intro, right? So I purposely didn't give you an intro, but for my students, I sometimes do a video where I, you know, set the stage for them. And uh, sometimes it'll be in writing with like, you know, tips or whatever. You can determine how you wanna do that. Um, but definitely give them an onboarding experience of some kind so that they know what to expect. And then you wanna have an activity at the end that says, well, how did you feel? Did you get out like we did? Are you frustrated? Um, are you confused? Uh, are you angry? Are you happy? Like, are you excited because you got it? You know, because we don't want to build up physical escape rooms that you pay to go to are built so that you fail because then you have to pay more money to do it again. Right. And that's how they make their money. You pay your first 20, your second 20, your third 20, because you want to get out because you're, you're in there and you, you can't not win or get out. We don't want to do that in education. We want our students to be successful. We want them to get through the rooms, but we also don't want it to be so easy that it wasn't a challenge. So there's a little balance that we have to do. Um, so Mary has a question about what is sustainment piece? I'm not sure, Mary, that I understand the question. If the main learning have sentence. Yes, so, all right, I see what you're, you're asking. So the idea, the idea in doing it in the beginning is to introduce it. The idea at the end is just to make sure that that key points or things that you really want them um, to have explored during that module are reviewed. Um, I don't give a lot of tests. I really don't give any tests in most of my literature classes. Um, the sales requires a final exam, but typically testing is not the way that I, I measure learning to begin with, but escape rooms kind of help them to like bring you know, bring the knowledge back in, in a fun sort of way to help them with whatever the final assessment piece is. So for Dante's Inferno, they do write a paper at the end. So it is important that they know which level is which. It's important that they know um, a little bit about Dante and, and his history and why he put people where he put them. So that escape room reinforces some of the things they kind of have to know in order to write the paper, because the, the paper is about um, the paper is about art's influence on on life and life's influence on art. So um, it's really to help them kind of understand it. And I can say that students that I've had five six years ago will still write to me and tell me how much they love doing you know a game or an escape room or making a monopoly game or uh, we do choose your own adventure and. We do uh, Oregon Trail kinds of games and stuff like that. So 
I think it's just they, they it's very scary to read hard literature but games are fun and escape rooms are kinds of games so they get invested in that part of it but they're doing the learning along with it so it's almost like a bait and switch right um I would, I'm happy to share, um, they're, they're long. That was the, the reason I did this kind of simple one. Um, but I don't know, I don't want to, the Llewellyn, um, I would be happy to share them. They're open source and you're welcome to use them and you're welcome to adapt them as well. So there's, there's a bunch. I had, a, they used to be on Wikispaces. I used to um, put them on there and then Wikispaces went out of business. So I kind of just hold on to them. So I, I'd be happy to share them. So plan, test them, have students test them. I have students make escape rooms. Um, that's another way for them to learn material too, is to have them make them, give them the instructions, let them, um, you know, put, if it's a physical uh, classroom, I might put them in groups. Um, I don't do a lot of collaboration with online students um, just because that's, it doesn't work with the way I think about the world. So I, their collaboration is they make a game themselves and then others play it and then give uh, feedback um, and what gets graded isn't the just doing it, it's the tie to the literature. So if we're playing Grand Theft Auto or playing Fallout, it's the writing that they do that's comparing it or discussing their choices or whatever it is they're doing. The grade is always centered on the writing because that's what I teach. Um, and then revise as you need. Things change. Um, you might want to add something in. You might want to take something out. Sometimes something that worked in a test, students, you do it with your class and it doesn't work or they have ideas. I always have them at the end say like, what would you have added in here? What's something that I missed? I have them evaluate the game itself and me and the game. And so they often have really great ideas and great feedback. So I'll revise it. Um, and also to keep it fresh because if you play this game, with if you teach five classes, if that's your load, or if you teach three or four, and you have that many students playing it, the clues and the answers get out quickly. So um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in switching it up and I might have three different Dante Inferno games going at one time with each class playing a different game. I will absolutely put a list together for you of the escape room games. There's fun, I have Dante's Inferno, I have Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, um, Leaves of Grass, there's a few more. Uh, there's a Vindication of the Rights of Woman. There's a, there's a few. <laughs> I teach a lot of different stuff. Then I have some tech writing ones for uh, tech writing students. If you have questions or if you want me to test your games, my email is here. Um, just shoot me an email. Uh, right now we're all working from home. And so, and I'm running the online department. We've moved online like most of you have as well. I think everybody has. So um, I might not get back to you right away, but I'll definitely, when things sort of, you know, even out, uh, hopefully by the end of this month. Um, there is not a link yet, Natasha. I had to rehouse them. So right now they're just, you know, in the courses, but I have them in a, in a Word doc and I can make them available. So, does anybody have any questions about how they're built or how you would use them? Does anybody have any ideas about um, one that they would like to create and that we can work together to help you uh, think of some ideas? So the last thing that I want to show you, uh, let's show you two more things. I want to do this. I want to, if you are bored during COVID, you can, um, you, if you just Google online escape rooms, you can come up, um, there are a whole bunch and there's some free, some that you pay for, um, but you can, you know, there are a lot of these that you can practice from. And I get all of my ideas from doing them. So I'll go and I'll be like, oh, that was a really great puzzle or that was a really great challenge. And then, um, you know, I kind of 
you know, just like video games, just like playing video games. It's, you know, the more you do it, the more you become comfortable with it. Um, oh, so Ira, I've done this with faculty for faculty training. Um, and then that is the advantage of the breakout EDU kit to even if you just buy one, because they have a great one on the 80s, which is pretty much the age group of our, our faculty. And they had such a good time doing it. And so if you're not that creative, I think I saw it in chat. Somebody said, I'm not this creative. That's okay, because there's pre-made kits out there. And all you do is set the locks. And then you print out the stuff. And they have online games where you just you set up the materials. They give you a step-by-step-by-step -step -step instruction list of what exactly what you have to do. Uh, so it is really worth that it's really valuable to at least buy one kit so that you have access to it. Um, and they've done tremendous work and, you know, K through 12 and um, higher ed business, team building, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, stuff like that. Um, oh, that's a great, so Clara wants to make one for plant growth regulation. Um, they have to figure out which PGRs would cause specific types of plant growth. That's awesome. Oh, good, you used back to, I've used the Back to the Future game too. That's a fun one. That's a, absolutely a fun one. So there are a lot of tools and resources. Um, oh, it would be awesome to do one for the library. So I've enjoyed making them. I, I think uh, they do take a little time to make and tweak and stuff like that, but they are a lot of fun. Students seem to respond really well. They like to make them too. Um, a word of caution though, when students make them, like give them very specific guidelines because otherwise, you know, it'll be all over the place. So I always say they have to have three, at least three locks that have to be solved and uh, they have to do their intro and they have to do their, their post, you know, their, their, you know, post activity. So, you know, do you want to talk, if it's a team building activity at the end, you want to talk about, <clears throat> you know, how did you work as a team? a leader who got frustrated blah 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 if it's a you know if it's focused on chaucer then the, the post activity is like you know you know what is important to remember about the canterbury tales while well, they were never finished that's one so nobody ever won one of the clues in there is like you know who wins at the end of the canterbury tales who wins the free dinner at the tavern the answer is nobody because they were never finished so um you know so you know have them talk, have some really guided um, requirements if they're making the games. Science and nursing actually has a lot in the, in the breakout EDU. Nursing has done quite a few. So Ira has a good, um, a good point. Like do students struggle with this? It depends on the level of student. That is definitely for sure. And um, it depends on your expectations. So, you know, I try to build every game that we do and whatever we're doing, whether it's building a Monopoly game or building an escape room or um, playing uh, Grand Theft Auto. I try to build the assignment so that students can be successful and that they realize that the thing that they are graded on is the writing. It's not, do I know how to jump in a video game? It's not, do I know how to make physical community chest cards, right? Like that's not the grade. The grade is the thought that went into making the cards or, um, you know, that it actually tied to the subject matter, you know? So it's, it's important to make sure that the students are comfortable that technology is not the thing they're graded on. And so I don't do escape rooms like the first two weeks of class. I don't do anything like this. I have the students get comfortable with me first before I start introducing games. And um, one of the first assignments we do is a VR tour using Google Tour Creator to put into the Oculus Quest. And if that were the first assignment that students got, they would panic because they would think that the technology is the thing that they have to care about when reality, the thing I'm grading are the paragraphs that they're writing in the tour. Uh, and they do a thing about their childhood and 10 places that have an impact on them. So, you know, it's uh, definitely, you wanna time it correctly in the semester so that students are comfortable doing it. Librarians are awesome. Trying to make sure I got all the um, other the clues are based off the movie for the Back to the Future one. It's um and there's there's enough clips out out there for Back to the Future that even if they haven't seen the movie, 
you can get enough material. Um, and, and that one that's pre-made, they have little clips and stuff that you can, that you watch to get. And if you have physical space, you want to decorate it. You know, an online space, you, you're kind of limited to how you can decorate it. But, and you don't have to be a programmer either. Like that's the most important takeaway is that you don't have to be, you know, the ones that are on the, the sites that you can go online. I mean, they have programmers that are making them and they're game programmers. You don't have to do that. You can do, you can do all this with PowerPoint if you needed to, if, if ThingLink was, was um, a barrier. You could use PowerPoint to give the clues and stuff like that. All right, if there are no questions or any other questions or ideas, this is a, was a short talk because I thought it was shorter. I didn't realize I had so much time. So I was so concerned that I would be, you know, bumping up against the, um, the keynote, which I wanted, I'm so excited to go see. So I wanted to keep it short and sweet and give you some ideas. Um, and again, my, my email is here. If you, um, if you have ideas or you just want to bump any ideas off to me to see if it works or if there's one out there that's on your topic, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, can I share my thoughts about differentiation in, a, in your games? Um, hmm. In the physical rooms, and in the online rooms, this wasn't in this example here, but I, there are different ways to answer each of the locks. So, um, so depending on your learning style or what you might pay attention to, there are different ways to solve a lock. There are also red herrings, so things that will get you down a rabbit hole, um, you know, and so that you can kind of come back to the, the right material. Um, online games, it's one of the hardest part is, is making sure that it's accessible to all the students, right? So if you're using video that it's closed captioned, if you are, um, if it's, uh, you, you have a visually impaired student that it's um, also able to be read by a screen reader. So you want to make sure that, that uh, it's accessible to everyone or you have an alternate equally cool assignment for students to do if you can't make this particular assignment accessible. Um, so you, so I definitely, the way that I teach online is that I, I get a sense of my students and what they can do when I'm building these things. And I have enough now that I can pick and choose depending on um, the kinds of students that are in the class, the sort of the community of the class. Um, but I do try to make most of what I do, whether it's escape rooms or other games, um, accessible to each kind of learner and each kind of I don't know if that answers your question. But excellent, excellent question. And, and honestly, the technology has gotten a lot better. I want to say that. So back when I started, does anybody, has anybody here ever played Unreal Tournament? Like I, I'm probably really, really old. <laughs> it sounds like the only person who's heard of the game. So when I was a junior faculty member a thousand years ago, my, first, my sort of my introduction to using technology and tools, thank, thank you, Stacy, you've heard of it. <laughs> I feel so old. Um, I used a game, I was, I was at a community college in Pennsylvania and um, I was junior faculty and uh, there was a faculty member, a tenured faculty member at Drexel University and he was using Unreal tournaments um, and he had converted them to use with his graduate organic chemistry students. So I had gone to a presentation at a conference much like this one, saw this, was like, oh, I want to try that because the thing that I was struggling with was teaching grammar to ESL students. So we worked with the Unreal Tournament game behind the scenes and the way that game works is there's levels. So there's 20 levels and on each level, there would be four sentences that were identical. One of them was grammatically correct. And so what you would do is, you know, we're community college, we can't have actual guns. So we made, made the guns into marshmallow shooters and water guns. You would go on each level, you would shoot the correct sentence and that would take you to the next, to the next level. But if you got to level 15 and you shot the wrong sentence, you went back to level one. So it became a race. Then if you got to level 20, you got a picture of my cat. Because my cat's cool. So on a pretest in that semester, when I gave the pretest for grammar and mechanics and sentence structure, every single person, there were 27 students in the class, 
every stu student failed the pretest. So, and in my short experience as a junior faculty member, I knew that worksheets, like they've had 12 years of worksheets and that hasn't worked. They've had 12 years of the same kind of teaching methods and that hasn't worked. So I decided to try this Unreal Tournament, made the game, made the maps, worked with the students. It was a little, you know, a little bit challenging in the beginning because I mean, these are old video games, so it's not as easy as video games are now to play. Uh, but we figured that out. They played the games. And then on the post-test, uh, two students um, dropped the class because of reasons not at all connected to video games. Um, but of the 25 students that were left in the class, every single student passed with a C or better on that same assessment they took in the beginning. So I knew then in my early years that this was the kind of way that I was going to teach and that I'm a practitioner. I'm not a research person. Um, I, I use what works. I modify things all the time. Um, you know, I, I'm using different things as they come out right now. I'm using VR and AI and all different kinds of stuff. Um, I would love to put all the stuff I do in the hands of a researcher um, to do the data collection and, and to see what the impact is long term. I just know that on the student evaluations, they're always very positive, even for tools they think they don't like in the beginning. Um, and then years later, I'll see students or they'll write to me and say, I remember making the mobile for Dante's Inferno, or I remember going on a, on a virtual pilgrimage in Second Life for the Canterbury Tales or whatever. Like they remember it years later, like 20 years later. So, you know, um, I know, I know that's such a good point, Stacy. Like practice does help. I think what happens is they they get I don't know like disconnected because they they think well I've done twelve years of worksheets and it hasn't helped me and I still flunk this test, you know. So what happens is it's really like a bait and switch, right? They get so invested in playing the video game that they don't realize that what they've actually learned is how to tell if a, if there's a comma splice. Right, it becomes this whole other thing so that they're able to detect quickly because they want to beat their friends. Like they're playing a game, but to me, I'm watching like, oh, that person knows how to use a comma now. I have, and one more person isn't gonna get passed along not knowing how to use a comma, you know? And, um, you know, so it, it helped. Um, it helped them anyway. So I haven't been using escape rooms, I think, long enough to do any longitudinal studies or <laughs> collect any data on them. Um, but the students enjoy them. Um, but again, it's not a major grade earner in that module. So there's other things they're doing in the module too to learn the content. I will teach you with Unreal Tournament, Stacy, how to use a comma. And then you can get a picture of my cat. Well, I appreciate everybody. Um, everybody's uh, participation and good spirit. I thank you for uh, suffering through uh, the fake escape room, but hopefully in seeing one, you can see like the best practices and how to put them together, the things that will derail students um, if they're frustrated and don't know what to do and how quickly they become disengaged. They probably become more disengaged online quickly than they do if they're with you in physical space, because in physical space, you can kind of guide them, but are doing this independently and on their own. So thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, moderator, is there anything I have to do at the end? Is there like a link that folks fill out or do we give everybody uh, to go with stars? Um, I, uh, I, I pasted the, the form link in there, so people would have to copy and paste it. Um, we did also put it on the ELCC Virtual Conference 2020 schedule. It's available at the very top. Um, so if people are having issues um, accessing it here, it's also available on that schedule. Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody. I wish you all the best in health and safety. Um, I live in a very small county of Pennsylvania, so we are not as infected as Philadelphia. I know I saw some folks from Philly. Um, so my heart goes out to everyone, and I hope that you're safe and well. And let's hope that we all can go hiking soon. And thank you. Thanks, Beth. Thank you.